Hey everyone, it's Professor Pemberton. In this video, we're going to talk about complex zero and the fundamental theorem of algebra. So we've already seen that an nth degree polynomial function will have at most n real zeros. However, in the complex number system, an nth degree polynomial will have exactly n zeros if you count their multiplicity, and also can be factored exactly into n linear factors. So this fact is the consequence of what's called the fundamental theorem of algebra, which was proved by German mathematician Carl Frederick Gauss in 1799 during his doctoral dissertation at the age of 22. So in this video, we're going to focus on applying the fundamental theorem of algebra to find the zeros over the complex number system and also to factor a polynomial into a product of linear factors. So the fundamental theorem of algebra. The following theorem is the basis of much the work in factoring polynomial functions and solving polynomial equations. So the theorem, the fundamental theorem of algebra, says that every polynomial function written in its general form a sub n x to the n power plus a sub n minus 1 x to the n minus 1 power plus dot 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 a sub 1 x plus a sub 0. The leading coefficient a sub n is not 0 and your degree is greater than or equal to 1, the highest power on the x. So the coefficients could be real numbers but they also could be complex coefficients. They will have at least one complex 0. And so the fundamental theorem of algebra and the factor theorem show that a polynomial function can be factored completely into linear factors over the complex number system. So the theorem is called the complete factorization theorem. Let's say p of x is a polynomial function where the degree is greater than or equal to 1. Then there exist complex numbers. So a is a complex number, c sub 1, c sub 2, all the way to c sub n. Those are all complex numbers. And a cannot be 0. Then the polynomial function can be factored completely into linear factors. So a is a complex number or the greatest common factor of all the coefficients. So that could be factored out first. But then all the other factors are linear factors. And you'll have x subtract one complex zero, x subtract another complex zero, all the way to x subtract your last complex zero. And so c sub 1, c sub 2, c sub 3 through c sub n, those are all complex zeros of this polynomial p of x. And to find the complex zeros of this nth degree polynomial function, we usually factor the polynomial as much as possible first. And then we use the quadratic formula on the parts that we cannot factor any further over the real number system. Then we can find out what are the complex zeros by solving the quadratic equation using the quadratic formula. So in the next couple of examples, we're going to find the complete factorization of polynomial functions by finding both the real and the complex zeros. So example one, factoring a polynomial function completely, find the real and the complex zeros for each of the following polynomial functions, then write the polynomial function in its complete factorized form. So number one, we're going to factorize f of x equals x cubed, subtract 3x squared plus x subtract 3. Notice in this polynomial function you have four terms, so let's try factoring by grouping first. So if you group the first two terms, x cubed minus 3x squared, so group those in parentheses, and you group the last two terms, x minus 3 in parentheses, notice that the first set of parentheses has an x squared in common, so you can factor out x squared as a greatest common factor. And so x squared factored out from the first group, you'll have an x subtract 3 left over, and notice that the second group has no greatest common factor other than 1, so it just stays x subtract 3. So now notice you have an x subtract 3 in common with both groups. So it can be factored out as a greatest common factor. So x minus 3 is a greatest common factor. And then you have x squared plus 1 left over. And so f of x can be factored as x squared plus 1, that factor, times the factor x minus 3. So x minus 3, that's a linear factor. But the x squared plus 1, that's a quadratic factor. Now notice, if you take x squared plus 1 and set it equal to 0, it will not have any real zeros, any real solutions you'll have complex solutions. So x squared plus 1 does not factor any further if you're talking about real solutions or real zeros. However, we can use a quadratic formula to find out what is the solutions of x squared plus 1. So if you take f of x equals x squared plus 1 times x minus 3, and that is equal to 0, so you can find out the zeros of that polynomial function, that means x squared plus 1 equals 0 or x minus 3 equals 0. Well, x minus 3 equals 0 gives us x equals 3. That's a real 0. But then if you have x squared plus 1 equals 0, that gives you x squared equals negative 1. And if you use the square root on both sides of the equation so you can solve for x, then you'll have square root of x squared is equal to plus or minus. So remember the plus or minus because you're taking the square root that came out of square power. You have plus or minus square root of negative 1 on the right side of the equation. Well, square root of negative 1 is not a real number. It's a complex number or an imaginary number. So x equals plus or minus, and the square root of negative 1 is the imaginary unit i. So this is x equals plus or minus i and the real zero is x equals 3. So x equals i and x equals negative i, those are called complex zeros. They're not real numbers, they're complex numbers. So you have two complex zeros and you have one real zero in this case.
And so you can rewrite this polynomial function into a product of linear factors using both the real zero and also the complex zeros. So f of x will factor as completely x minus 3. That linear factor does not factor any further. x attract one of the complex zeros, so x attract i. And the other factor is x attract negative i, or x plus i. So notice you have a product of linear factors from the complete factorization theorem. And so this is a completely factorized form for this polynomial function f of x. All right, let's try number two. This time the function is g of x equals x cubed subtract 2x plus 4. Notice that if you substitute in negative 2 into the polynomial function, you'll have negative 2 cubed subtract 2 times negative 2 plus 4, which is negative 8 plus 4 plus 4, which gives you 0. So if negative 2 is substituted into this polynomial function, that means that the remainder, whenever you take g of x and divide by x plus 2, the remainder is 0. So that means x plus 2 is a factor of this polynomial function g of x. So we, now we can use synthetic division to find out what is the quotient polynomial. So you have the polynomial function g of x. If you divide by x plus 2, the remainder is 0. And if you use synthetic division, the polynomial function 1 coefficient 0 for the x squared coefficient, negative 2, and 4 goes on the inside of the division bar. And since we know that negative 2 is a real 0 of the polynomial function g of x, negative 2 will go on the outside because we're divided by x plus 2. So now drop down the leading coefficient 1. And now multiply, negative 2 times 1 gives you negative 2. Add, 0 plus negative 2 gives you negative 2. Negative 2 times negative 2 gives you positive 4. And then negative 2 plus 4 gives you positive 2. Negative 2 times 2 gives you negative 4. And then the last column, when you add, will give you 0. So the remainder is 0. But we want the quotient polynomial, which is x squared subtract 2x plus 2. And so x squared minus 2x plus 2, that's the quotient polynomial. And the remainder is 0 over what we were dividing by, x plus 2. And so this just simplifies to be x squared minus 2x plus 2. So we have a way to factor g of x. g of x is x plus 2 because we know that negative 2 is a real 0. So x plus 2 is a factor. And the other factor is a quadratic factor, x squared minus 2x plus 2. And so if you want to find out what are the zeros, the real zeros, and also the complex zeros for this polynomial function, you need to actually find out what is g of x equal to 0. What values of x will actually solve this equation? So you have x plus 2 equals 0, or the quadratic factor equals 0. So x equals negative 2, that's one real 0. But if you want to solve x squared to track 2x plus 2, that does not factor over the real numbers. There are not two numbers that multiply to 2 and also add to negative 2, unless you're talking about imaginary numbers or complex numbers. So if you want to solve x squared minus 2x plus 2 equals 0, you need to use the quadratic formula. So you have x equals opposite of b plus or minus square root b squared to track 4 times a times c, all divided by 2a. Notice that the a is 1, the coefficient for the x squared, the b is negative 2, and the constant term c is 2. So if you substitute this into the quadratic formula, you'll have the opposite of negative 2, so positive 2, plus or minus, square root, b squared, so that will be negative 2 in parentheses squared, subtract 4 times a, a is 1, and c is positive 2. And then you also divide by 2 times a, so 2 times 1. And so it looks like you have 4 subtract 8 inside the square root because you have negative 2 squared that like, will give you 4. And then 4 times 1 times 2 will give you 8. So 2 plus or minus square root 4 minus 8 all divided by 2 times 1 will give you 2. And so 2 plus or minus square root of negative 4 all over 2. The square root of negative 4 is 2i. It's square root of negative 1, which is i, times the square root of 4, which is 2. So square root of negative 4 is 2i. So it's 2 plus or minus 2i all divided by 2. And so notice you have a 2 in common with all the coefficients. So the numerator has 2 that can be factored out and then cancel out or simplify with the denominator. And you have 1 plus or minus i. Those are the complex zeros or solutions to the equation x squared subtract 2x plus 2 equals 0. And so now we have the complete factorized form for the polynomial function g of x. We know that one of the factors was x plus 2. And now we know the other two factors. The other two factors are x attract one of the zeros is 1 plus i, so it'll be x attract 1 plus i in parentheses. And the other factor will be x minus 1 minus i. 1 subtract i was also a complex zero. And so you have x plus 2 is one of the factors. x minus 1 minus i is the other linear factor. And the last linear factor is x attract 1 plus i. And so this is the complete factorized form for the function g of x. All right, now let's talk about zeros and their multiplicities. So in the complete factorization theorem, the numbers c1, c2, through cn, those are the complex zeros of the polynomial function p of x. We know that from when we talked about real zeros, x attract a number c, that actually is telling us that the c was a real zero. Well, if x attracts c sub k, 
If this factor, x minus that complex number, appears m times, the complete factorization of p of x, c sub k is a complex zero, which will have multiplicity m. So this next theorem is called the zeros theorem. Every polynomial function of degree n greater than or equal to 1 has exactly n zeros, provided that a zero of multiplicity m is counted m times. So if you count all the real zeros and all the complex zeros, including their multiplicities, it should equal the degree of the polynomial function, which is n. So the following table will give us some examples of polynomial functions with their complete factorizations over the complex number system and also their real and complex zeros. So let's look at a degree 1 polynomial function. Let's say you have p of x equals x minus 4. If you set this polynomial function equal to 0, the 0 is x equals 4, and you only have one of them. And so you only have one 0, it was a real 0 in this case, and the degree was 1. If you have a quadratic polynomial, so degree 2, let's say you have x squared subtract 10x plus 25, that does factor two numbers multiplied to 25 and also add to negative 10. That's negative 5 and negative 5. So x minus 5 and x minus 5. That's x minus 5 all squared. So the only 0 is x equals 5, but it has multiplicity 2 because the factor x minus 5 appears twice in the factorization of p of x. And so if you count the multiplicity of that 0, you have 2. And so that's the same as the degree of the polynomial function. Let's say you have a cubic polynomial. So degree 3, you have p of x is equal to x cubed plus x. Notice that both of these terms have an x in common, so you could factor out the x from x cubed plus x. But then what would be left over would be x squared plus 1, and we know that that will factor as x minus i times x plus i from our earlier work. So notice that the complete factorization, if you set this polynomial function equal to 0, x is equal to 0, or x equals i, and x equals negative i. So you have one real zero and two complex zeros. And since each of the zeros occurs once, each has multiplicity one, and that means you have a total number of zeros, three, which was also the degree of the polynomial. This is also true if you have a degree four, degree five polynomial. The number of zeros that you'll have will equal the degree of the polynomial function if you count the number of real zeros and complex zeros, including their multiplicities. So example three, we're going to factor a polynomial function which will have complex zeros. So find the real and the complex zeros of the polynomial function f of x equals 3x to the fifth plus 24x cubed plus 48x. Write the polynomial function in its complete factorized form and also determine the multiplicities of each real and also complex zero. So let's take f of x and set it equal to zero so we can find out the real zeros and also the complex zeros. Notice that each of the terms, they all have an x in common and the coefficients 3, 24, and 48, they all have a 3 in common. So let's factor out 3x from each of the three terms. So if you factor out 3x, the first term that will be left over will be x to the fourth. The second term will have 8x squared left over. And then 3x will go into 48x 16 times. So you have x to the fourth plus 8x squared plus 16 inside the parentheses. And that's multiplied by the GCF or greatest common factor is 3x. And it still equals zero after you multiply. So now we know it factors as 3x times this other polynomial, x to the fourth plus 8x squared plus 16. Let's see if this polynomial will factor using the rational zeros theorem. So let's find out what are all the possible rational zeros for this polynomial function. Notice that the constant term is 16. The rational zeros theorem says that the numerator must be factors of the constant term. So factors of 16, that would be plus or minus 1, plus or minus 2, plus or minus 4, plus or minus 8, and plus or minus 16. Whereas q was factors of the leading coefficient, which in this case, if we're only considering what's inside the parentheses, the leading term is 1x to the fourth. So the leading coefficient is 1. Factors of 1 are plus or minus 1. So all the possible rational zeros for this polynomial function, x to the fourth plus 8x squared plus 16, those are plus or minus 1, plus or minus 2, plus or minus 4, plus or minus 8, and plus or minus 16. However, if you check every single one of these possible rational zeros, the remainder will not be 0 in any of those cases. And so what that means is that g of x does not factor with any real zeros. They're actually complex zeros. So let's take the polynomial function g of x, which is equal to x to the fourth plus 8x squared plus 16. Let's think about this as reverse FOIL. What two terms will multiply and give you x to the fourth? Well, it could be x squared and x squared. So x squared in each set of parentheses. I need two numbers that multiply to 16, so I can try 4 and 4. And those middle terms, when you multiply using the FOIL method, the outside two terms multiplied together and the two inside terms multiplied together, that should give you 8x squared. So let's see if this works x squared times x squared gives you x to the fourth. 4x squared when you multiply the outside two terms 
4x squared when you multiply the inside two terms. So if, so if you add 4x squared and 4x squared, you get 8x squared. And then 4 times 4 will give you 16. And so this is how g of x factors. It's x squared plus 4 times x squared plus 4, or x squared plus 4 all squared. And so if you have the entire polynomial function equal to 0, that means x squared plus 4 in parentheses all squared equals 0, which means you have x squared plus 4 equals 0. And now you can solve for x by isolating the x on one side of the equation. So subtract 4 on both sides of the equation, you'll get x squared equals negative 4. Take the square root on both sides to cancel out the square power. So square root of x squared equals plus or minus because you're using a square root to cancel out a square power. You have plus or minus square root of negative 4. And we talked about this earlier. Square root of negative 4, it's square root of negative 1, which is i, and the square root of 4, which is 2. So it will be x equals plus or minus 2i. So there are two complex zeros for this polynomial function. You have x equals 2i and x equals negative 2i. However, notice that you had x squared plus 4 and it was being squared in the factorization of g of x. So that means you have x equals 2i, it has multiplicity 2, and x equals negative 2i also has multiplicity 2. The complex 0 will actually appear twice in the factorization of g of x. And so let's summarize everything that we found out. f of x is equal to 3x times x to the fourth plus 8x squared plus 16. Well, we factor what's inside the parentheses. f of x will be 3x times the quantity x squared plus 4 all squared. And so this is the complete factorized form over the real numbers. So notice that if you set the outside 3x equals 0, you'll get x equals 0. And so x equals 0 is a real 0 of multiplicity 1. However, x equals 2i is a complex 0 with multiplicity 2. And x equals negative 2i is a complex 0 of multiplicity 2. So let's summarize what we just found out from this last example. We're going to talk about complex zeros, and they actually come in conjugate pairs. So what we've noticed so far in the examples in this section is that the complex zeros of a polynomial function with real coefficients come in pairs. What that means is that if you have one complex number, we'll call it z, one complex number is a plus bi is a complex zero, then it's complex conjugate, and which will be denoted as z with a bar over top of it, so z bar, where you, if you take the first term and keep it the same, and you keep the second term the same, but you change the sign between them, those are called complex conjugates of one another. So a plus bi, is a complex zero. The a minus bi is also a complex zero of the same polynomial function. And so this is what's called the conjugate zeros theorem. So the theorem says if the polynomial function p of x has real coefficients, and if a complex number z is a zero of the polynomial function p of x, then the complex conjugate z bar is also a complex zero of the polynomial function p of x. In other words, complex zeros always appear in pairs. If you have a plus bi is a zero, then you automatically have its conjugate is also a complex zero of the same polynomial. So let's look at example four. Using the conjugate zeros theorem, determine the other zeros of the polynomial function p of x with real coefficients if one subtract i, four i, and seven are zeros of that polynomial function. So notice, if you have one subtract i is a complex zero of the polynomial function, then you automatically have, by using the conjugate zeros theorem, its complex conjugate is also a zero. So if x equals one subtract i is a complex zero, then its conjugate, x bar, one plus i, so you change the sign between the two terms, is also a complex zero of the polynomial function p of x. And for the same reason, if x equals four i is a complex zero of the polynomial function, then x equals negative 4i is also a complex conjugate. Notice that you only have an i term for this complex number, and so you only change the sign in front of the complex part. So if 4i is a complex zero, negative 4i is also a complex zero of the same polynomial function p of x. And since x equals 7 is a real number, that does not mean you have x equals negative 7 as well. It's only complex conjugates that come in pairs x equals 7 is a real number, and so it's just as it is. It's just a real 0. So p of x has a real 0 of x equals 7 and complex zeros of 1 to tract i, its complex conjugate 1 plus i, 4i, and also its complex conjugate negative 4i. So you actually have four complex zeros for this polynomial function and one real 0. All right, example 5. A polynomial with specified complex zeros. Find a polynomial function p of x which will have degree 5 with real coefficients, and you are also given the zeros of this polynomial function. It's 1, 
5i and also 1 plus i. So if you know that you have complex zeros, you also have their complex conjugates are also complex zeros. So if x equals 1, that means that x minus 1 is a factor of p of x. If x equals 5i is a complex zero, that means that x minus 5i is a factor of the same polynomial. However, if x equals 5i is a complex zero, then its conjugate is also a complex zero. So you'll have x equals negative 5i is also a complex zero. And so the factor that gives you that complex zero is x plus 5i, which will also be a factor of p of x. And x equals negative 5i are complex conjugates of one another. And notice you have 1 plus i is a complex zero of the polynomial function. So if x equals 1 plus i is a complex zero, then x subtract 1 plus i in parentheses is a factor of the polynomial function. And since 1 plus i is a complex zero, its conjugate is also a complex zero. So you have x equals 1 subtract i as well, which will give you a factor of x subtract 1 minus i in parentheses is a factor of p of x. And that's again because 1 plus i and 1 subtract i are complex conjugates of one another. So if you want to find out what is the polynomial function of degree 5 that has these zeros, this real zero of 1, and also complex zeros of 5i, negative 5i, and 1 plus i and 1 subtract i, it would be this polynomial function. p of x is equal to, well if 1 is a zero, then x minus 1 is its factor. If x equals 5i is a zero, then x minus 5i is a factor. Then you also know x plus 5i is also a factor of the polynomial because its complex conjugate is also a complex zero. And then you also have x attract 1 plus i is a factor of the polynomial function. And x attract 1 minus i in parentheses is a factor of the polynomial function because 1 plus i and 1 minus i are complex zeros and they're conjugates of one another. And so if you simplify the signs, you have x minus 1 times x plus 5i, x minus 5i, and then if you distribute the negative through the 1 plus i, you'll have x minus 1 plus i is a factor. And then you'll have x minus 1 minus i is also a factor of the polynomial function. So if you multiply these five factors together, you'll find out that the polynomial function is x to the fifth, subtract 3x to the fourth, plus 29x cubed, subtract 77x squared, plus 100x, subtract 50. This is a simplified form of multiplying out each of the five factors to get the polynomial function p of x. And so we knew it was degree 5, polynomial function, and this polynomial function has zeros of x equals 1, a real zero. You'll have a complex zero at x equals 5i, a complex zero at x equals negative 5i, the conjugate. You'll have a complex zero at x equals 1 plus i, and also its conjugate, x equals 1 subtract i. And then the last thing we're going to talk about in this video is what's called linear and quadratic factors. We've already seen that a polynomial function factors completely into linear factors in this video, if we use the complex numbers and also the complete factorization theorem. However, if we don't use complex numbers, then the polynomial function with real coefficients can always be factored into linear and quadratic factors. And so the definition of an irreducible polynomial is this, a quadratic polynomial with no real zeros. So if you ignore complex zeros and you only focus on what are the real zeros of the polynomial function, and factorize the polynomial only over the real numbers, a quadratic polynomial that does not factor over the real numbers is called irreducible over the real number system. In other words, a quadratic polynomial cannot be factored without using complex zeros if it's irreducible over the real number system. And so that leads into this last theorem. The theorem is linear and quadratic factors theorem. Every polynomial function, p of x, with real coefficients can be factored into a product of linear, and also irreducible quadratic factors. Quadratic factors that do not factor if you only consider real numbers as possible real zeros of the polynomial function. So if you have real coefficients for the polynomial function, it will factor into linear factors and also irreducible quadratic factors. So this finishes our video on complex zeros and the fundamental theorem of algebra. We use the fundamental theorem of algebra to find out the complex zeros over the complex number system and also to factor a polynomial function into a product of linear factors over the complex number system, or if you have over the real number system into a product of linear or irreducible quadratic factors. If you have any questions about any examples in this video, please let me know. Or if you have any questions while you work on the homework for this section, please let me know that as well. And I'll see you in the next video when we talk about rational functions.